Yes. So uh, welcome back. Uh, strangely, the, the 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 line went off, but then we are able to uh, continue. Yeah. So I was just telling you about the point which the court had made in the order against Marlboro Court Limited that you must give notice of the exclusion clause either before or at the time of making the contract and not uh, after. So let's keep uh, that uh, in mind. Okay, so of course the same uh, point applies to what we call like the exhibited uh, notices. Exhibited like uh, notices, uh, if the notice is meant to form part of the contract, then uh, it should be uh, brought to the attention before at the time of making the contract and not after. But uh, quite apart from uh, incorporation by notice, exemption clause or exclusion clause, which does not require signature, may also be incorporated by cause of dealing. In other words, if uh, between the two parties, certain practices have gone on for quite some time, and let's suppose that uh, this is not a one-off transaction. We'll be doing transaction every now and again. It's more like the same uh, uh, transaction that they are doing. In that case, because there have been previous course of dealing between them, uh, the court could uh, 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 say that the, course of the previous course of dealing can be considered as being a means which person uh, could be said to have accepted that certain exemption clause should be part and parcel of the contract uh, being uh, made, as happened in the case of a spending against the Bradshaw, uh, where the court uh, emphasized that if you are talking about the previous uh, course of dealing, then it is important that uh, the course of dealing must have been consistent. Being consistent means that the parties must have dealt with each other in respect of that particular transaction in that same way for a long time. Not that uh, maybe just a, a one-off or you have an inconsistency uh, here and there. And that was why in the case of uh, Makichion uh, against uh, David uh, McBrainy Limited, uh, the plaintiff had a scar ship, defendant's uh, ship, and the ship was evidently sailed into a rock and sank. Uh, plaintiff's car was lost, and he sued for the value of the car. Now, when the defendant was sued, defendant placed reliance on a condition in their contract of carriage, which purported to exclude liability for negligence. And during the trial, uh, the court, looking at the evidence, made a finding that it was the practice of the plaintiff and the defendant to require consignors. I, I mean, it was practice of the defendant or the dealers to require consignors, that is those who are giving their consignment or goods to them, to sign risk notes, which contain the conditions, but on this particular occasion, the defendant's representative forgot to ask the plaintiff to sign the risk note. So the plaintiff had consigned the goods on a number of previous occasions, and previous occasions, the risk note was signed. Sometimes it was asked to sign a risk note, and maybe if uh, there was forgetfulness and he was not asked to sign. 
he had never read the written note, despite the fact that he was signing on many occasions. And he didn't know uh, what conditions the written note actually contained. So the defendant put up that uh, because of the knowledge gained by the plaintiff agent on previous occasions when he assigned the risk note, the plaintiff should be bound by the conditions printed in the note, despite the fact that on the occasion in question, he had not signed one. Now the court had to make a determination as to whether there had been a consistent uh, course of dealing between the parties. And the court said that no, uh, if you look at what has gone on, the, the practice was not correct. There are a lot of inconsistency here and there because there were times that the plaintiff agent would be asked to sign, other times that they would not sign. For that matter, uh, the court could not uh, 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 come to conclusion that because of the previous course of dealing between the parties, that should be considered as being sufficient to have given notice to the plaintiff regarding the conditions or the exemption. Uh, so please, uh, let's keep uh, that in mind. Maybe if you are dealing with the uh, a consumer, right? If you are dealing with like an uh, ordinary consumer, uh, the previous course of dealing, especially the consistent pre previous course of dealing, uh, may not have to be just one or two. It may probably have to be more uh, before the courts will come to conclusion that uh, a previous course of dealing uh, exists. And if you look at the Holia against uh, Ramla uh, Motors Limited. The court was the view that, well, just uh, three or four transactions over a period of five years was not enough for the court to come to conclusion that a previous course of dealing actually existed between the parties and it needed to be more. It needed to be more. Yeah, so. What happened in the uh, uh, Ram, uh, uh, whole year against the Rambler Motors? I actually wanted to uh, mean it. Yeah. Yeah, there was something in that case I wanted to put for you as I indicated to you in the beginning. But I then uh, importantly, the court was making the point that uh, with respect to consumer contract, before the court will come to conclusion that uh, there had been a previous course of dealing. And for that matter, uh, that can take care of the exemption clause. More uh, needed to be done. Now we come to the last aspect of exemption or exclusion clause. Uh, as we indicated, for exclusion or exemption clause to be upheld, there must be clear evidence that it was incorporated. It was incorporated in the contract that it made part of the contract, and we have seen how uh, that uh, works out. That is. If you are dealing with the exemption which requires signature, then the fact that your signature is there means that you have accepted that it's formed part of the contract. The only exception being where you were deceived or where you were tricked into signing. So that is a different matter. And then we have also just seen uh, where your signature is not required. Then the law says that adequate or reasonable notice should be given to you regarding the existence of the exemption clause. And this should be before or at the time of making the contract, that it should be contemporaneous. And uh, we, we have seen a lot of it to that effect. And finally, we have also noted that 
it is possible having regard to the course of dealing before between the parties. So far as there has been a consistent course of dealing between the parties over a reasonable period of time, it, it will be enough on basis of that for the court to come to conclusion that yes, because of this consistent previous course of dealing, it can be taken for granted that we are very much aware of this exemption clause or that exclusion uh, clause. Now we come to construction or interpretation of exemption clause. And by interpretation or construction of exemption clause, we are referring to uh, the fact that when a breach contract has actually occurred and a party is trying to rely on the exclusion limitation clause in order to escape liability or in order to or reduce its liability, the court will need to interpret the wording of the exemption clause in order to see whether the clause covers the breach which has occurred. Does it cover the breach which has occurred? I mean, that's like, like constitutional law, for example. Uh, we know that, uh, and that if anybody is making an allegation that something done or not done uh, contravenes the constitution and is uh, inconsistent, and for that matter, it's not a void, it's an, it's, it's an invitation for the Supreme Court to do, if you like, interpretation, to interpret the relevant wording of the constitution in relation to whatever you're alleging to be unconstitutional to find out whether it agrees with the test of the constitution or it does not. So in the same vein, when it comes to construction or interpretation of exemption or limitation clauses, the court will need to construe, interpret the wording and find out if when it is interpreted, it is construed, it can encapsulate or it can encompass the particular uh, event or situation of breach, which has okay. Yeah, so that is uh, very important. Now, in terms of limitation clause, when the court will have to interpret, the courts are a bit more friendly towards limitation clause than exemption or switching clause. So a less straight approach is taken uh, in interpreting limitation clause than exclusion clauses. Uh, that is uh, to say that uh, the courts are better disposed to look a bit more favorable towards limitation clauses than exemption or exclusion clause for obvious reason. By exemption or exclusion clause, one person is trying to say that under no circumstances can I uh, be held liable for anything, for any breach. But for a limitation clause, the person is not saying that I'm not prepared to be held liable at all. All that he or she is saying is that, yes, I can be held liable for breach, but only up to this point or not beyond that point. So that is, if you like, uh, much more uh, reasonable. That's like maybe like the uh, insurance uh, policies and things like that. So the courts are a bit uh, more friendly towards that. And that was why in the case of uh, Alsa uh, Kraj Fishing Company Limited against the Marvin Fishing Company Limited, uh, Lord Simon was at pains to state, and I quote, Clauses of limitation are not regarded by the courts with the same hostility as clauses of exclusion. This is because they, is they must be related to other contractual uh, terms. Yeah, so this actually gives you a clear sense of how the courts are more uh, better disposed to uh, 
exemption, I mean, to limitation clauses than, uh, 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 than exclusion or exemption uh, clauses. Another uh, rule uh, which the court uh, makes use of in trying to interpret exemption clause is the principle we call contra preferentum, uh, the contra uh, preferentum uh, rule. That is uh, another rule uh, the court uh, makes use of in trying to interpret uh, exemption uh, clause. And I would like us to look at the page 274 of uh, Jilpu. And I have shared uh, Jilpu uh, with you. I've shared a PDF of Jilpu with you. If you don't have money to buy the, the hard copy, you can still uh, have it. So if you look at the page 274 of Jilpu, for example, uh, you know, the author makes the point that any ambiguity in exemption clause will be resolved against the party seeking to rely upon it. What does that mean? When we say ambiguity, ambiguity simply means that uh, the particular writing before you is capable of bearing more than one meaning. It may have two or three or possible meanings. And the meanings may not be the same. Some meanings may be more favorable. Other meanings may be unfavorable. So therefore, by contra preferentum from the <coughs> By contra preferentum is a, from the Latin. You know, contra in Latin simply means that against. So prefer, prefer preferentum, the person who is asking for exemption clause or the person at whose instant the exemption clause, exemption clause was included in the contract. Where you have several possible meaning, that is the ambiguity we are talking about. The exemption clause can bear several possible meaning. Some of the meanings are favorable to the person at whose instant the exemption clause was included. And some of the meanings are not favorable to the person at whose instant the exemption clause was included. Now, where that is the case, then according to the contract preferential rule, the court adopt the meaning which is disadvantageous or which is uh, detrimental to the interest of the person at whose instance the exemption clause is included or the person who is seeking to take advantage of the exemption clause so as to escape liability or so as to minimize liability, the, the, the court should adopt one of the competing meanings, which is more unfavorable to him. And a very good case to illustrate that is a case of Houghton against Trafalgar Insurance Company Limited. Very interesting case. In Houghton against Trafalgar Insurance Company Limited, uh, what happened was that there was a car insurance policy. And of course, a car insurance policy here reminds me of how insurance companies are very, uh, they, are, they are very fast when it comes to taking money from customers. Pay your premium, pay your premium. Those of you who see my car, you'll notice that uh, about two weeks ago, the, the back of my car, there's a bit of like a, a truck, truck driver ran into it and ran away. I have comprehensive insurance from uh, SIC and I pay a premium of, I think about 9,000 Ghana cities. But instead of they, uh, you know, just hurry, hurrying up the process for me to get money and get it fixed and all that, I'm still here trying to sort things out with them. Now, let's come back to Horton against Trafalgar Insurance Company Limited. 
uh, as I told you, there was a car insurance policy. This policy excluded liability for uh, a damage caused or arising while the car is conveying any load in excess of that for which it was constructed. You know, if you look at the car, uh, the car has what they call like the, the gross weight and things like that. The, the, the rare capacity uh, of the car, the load that it can carry. So the insurance uh, had a clause and said that, well, if you use the car to carry more load than it was designed, then we are not uh, prepared to cover you for any accident which may occur. At the time of the accident, there were six uh, uh, passengers in the car uh, with seating accommodation for five. So five could sit according to the design of the car. And the insurance, the insurers, that the insurance company sought to deny liability, sought to run away, claiming that uh, this was a load in excess of that for which the car was written. Now, before the court could resolve this conundrum, this difficulty, as to whether the insurance company was right in trying to say that, because you have taken says you have exceeded the capacity for which the car was made, and for that matter, we are protected by the exemption clause, we are not going to pay. It was necessary for the court to interpret uh the meaning of the word load because if you look at the clause you know if you look at the clause uh where my case is uh, let me put it here so if you look at i'll put it in red you can see that the red yeah so if you look at the the clause it said that um uh while the car is conveying any load in essence of that for which it was constructed to any load in essence of that for which it was constructed. What is the meaning of load? Load in this context is ambiguous. Ambiguous in the sense that it can mean more than one thing. Load can mean passengers. Load can mean cargo. So what is the meaning of load for purpose, purposes of this clause? who says that they are uh, avoiding liability for damage caused or arising Why the car is conveying the excess of that for which it was constructed. Now, the court held that the word load covered only cases in which there was a specific weight that must not be exceeded, as in the case of lorries or vans. It is very interesting to pay attention to the short victim of uh, Lord Darcy's Roma, which I quote, and that was the more reason why I came here. Uh, Lord Darcy's Roma uh, speaking quote, I think that it will be most regrettable if a provision of this kind were held to have the force for which the defendants contend. It will be a serious thing for a motorist involved in collision if he were told that the particular circumstances of the accident excluded him from the benefit of the policy, I think that any clause or provision that ought to have the effect ought to be clear and unambiguous so that motorist knows exactly where he stands. This provision is neither clear nor unambiguous if applied to a private motor car. I have not the least idea uh, what it means. Uh, so simply put, you see that uh, where the court was trying to uh, say that in the event of uh, uh, the contract having uh, you know, different uh, meanings, then we are going to adopt one which will be to the disadvantage for uh, the person 
at whose uh, instant the exemption clause was, was included. Now, what about uh, the situation uh, in terms of uh, library or uh, negligence? Of course, the, the other uh, cases that uh, are recited in the material, so the case of uh, Andrews against uh, Singer II, uh, there was an ambiguous word there. I'd like you to read and then uh, uh, include that as well. Now let's look at exclusion of liability for negligence, uh, where uh, there has been an exemption clause, trying to say that uh, will not accept liability for any uh, negligence. Uh, that we may otherwise be uh, guilty of, or which can be brought up uh, against us. Now. Additionally, uh, the way the court go about that is to limit the scope of the exclusion clause and construe them so that they cover only contractual liability unless the clause expressly extends the negligence. In other words, from your Ghana legal system and legal method, and I hope that uh, you are taking your legal system and legal method serious. You know, there's a topic we call division or classification of law, which you have learned. And I'm sure you have come across what we call the uh, uh, you know, concurrent uh, liability. You can have the same set of facts the set of facts may amount to a breach of contract. At the same time, you may be able to bring a cause of action to court, maybe for negligence and things like that. Now, it may so happen that in a contract, a person might have included exemption clause. And instead of just focusing on uh, maybe uh, excluding himself from any liability for breach or limiting his uh, liability for breach. The person may, for example, want to extend the protection which he wants the contract to give him and protection which even go beyond his contractual duties to other non-contractual things. So that is uh, what we are talking about. And, that is, can exemption clause uh, apply in respect of negligence? Well, a very useful case to consider is the case of uh, Canada Steamship Lines uh, Limited against uh, Al. And in that case, uh, Lord Martin of uh, Harrington laid down a test. Uh, contra construction or interpretation tests to ascertain whether the clause covers negligence liability. In other words, if you want to know uh, whether the exemption clause can be interpreted to give protection to the person also from even uh, negligence, uh, we need to uh, be guided by the, the guidelines which Lord Morton of Henryton uh, propounded in Canada Steamship Lines Limited against Al in 1952. And quote, the analysis think that the duty of court in approaching the consideration of such clauses may be summarized as follows. One, if the clause contains language which expressly exempts the person in whose favor it is made, Hereafter, called pro preference, that is a person at, who, at whose instant the exemption clause was included. From the consequences of the negligence of his own servant, effect must be given to that uh, provision. Two, if there is no express reference to negligence, the court must consider 
whether the words used are wide enough in their ordinary meaning to cover uh, negligence on the part of the defendants of the preference. If a doubt arises at this point, it must be resolved against the other party, that is the preference, the party at whose instance the clause was included. And three, if the words used are wide enough for the above purpose, the court must consider then whether the head of damage may be based on some ground other than that of negligence. Yeah, so at least what is important is that uh, the court is giving us some guidelines as to how it may go about in trying to make a determination as to whether exemption clause can extend to uh, negligence or cannot extend to uh, negligence. And I'll particularly like us to uh, look at the interesting case of uh, Alda Slade against uh, uh, Hendon uh, Landry uh, Limited. What happened in the Alda Slade uh, against the Hendon Landry Limited? Well, the plaintiff left 10 uh, large Irish lining handkerchiefs for the defendants to be washed. Landry lost the handkerchiefs, but then an asking for damages for uh, two pounds, one shillings, a bit because of the replacement of the handkerchiefs. The defendant sought to rely on condition three of the terms on which the handkerchief had been accepted. And this provided that, quote, the maximum amount allowed for loss or damage articles is 20 times the charge made for laundering, uh, calculated as uh, 11 shillings uh, five dam here. Now, it was how that only liability that could arise from the loss of the handkerchief by the defender was by establishing that the defendants were negligent. They owed only a duty to take reasonable care of the handkerchiefs so that there could be so strict, there could be no strict liability for that loss. And consequently, the condition could be applied to limit that, that negligence, liability, and damages payable to the plaintiff. But I would like you to pay attention to the, 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 the short opinion of master of the rules at the time. I'm not talking about Lord Denning. Of course, Lord Denning also became master of the rules, but he's not only the master of the rules. When we say the master of the rules, uh, MR, it refers to the president of the English Court of Appeal. So as at the time that the uh, this case was uh, decided. It was Lord Green, who was the master uh, of the rules. And I would like you to pay attention to his opinion. Because of time, uh, we cannot actually uh, discuss all that because we need to be bringing a class to an end uh, uh, very soon. Yeah, another uh, point uh, which we need to uh, touch on or which we need to uh, discuss with respect to interpretation of the exemption or exclusion clause is what is known as the doctrine of uh, fundamental uh, breach the doctrine of fundamental uh, breach. Now, the doctrine of fundamental breach is uh, a principle which has actually engaged the court for quite some time uh, until the case of uh, a photo production limited against the Corico Limited was decided in 1980. Now, fundamental breach simply means that there has been total non-performance. That is, as we know from uh, condition, there's a total non-performance or 
there's a serious breach which destroys the whole basis of the contract. So any of these senses could mean fundamental breach. So as a doctrine in relation exclusion or exemption clause, uh, before 1967, especially, the doctrine of fundamental breach was a major weapon in dealing with exclusion clauses. And how was it? The approach used to be that when there's a breach of contract and the breach in question can be interpreted as amounting to fundamental breach in the sense that there has been total non-performance, especially by the person uh, at whose instance the exemption clause was made in the contract or the person who stands to benefit from the exemption clause. If he is a guilty person in terms of having not performed at all what he was supposed to do under the contract, or there has been a serious breach which goes to the very foundation of the contract, that would also uh, be treated as fundamental breach. Then in that situation, you will not be allowed to take advantage of the exemption clause. The reason being that the exemption clause is part of the contract. And if there has been a fundamental breach, it's a repudiatory breach. And automatically, if the contract is repudiated, once the contract has come to an end, everything in it has come to an end, including the exemption clause, and you will not be allowed to take advantage of it. Yeah, so that used to be the point. So look at the case of a castle, Saro Limited, uh, against uh, Wallace. And in the cases of the Swiss uh, Atlantic, and then the Habit Plastics Limited against the Wheaton. But I would like us to uh, pay more attention to photo production uh, against uh, Siko uh, Rico uh, decided in 19. Uh, you notice that in the slide, sometimes I just use CNF. If I say CNF, I'm referring to Session 5 foot. And if I say A uh, e, uh, of C, uh, A, I'm referring to answering uh, on contract. And so uh, those are what I mean for in terms of the those uh, letters that I've used in the in the slides. So let's say a few uh, words about uh, photo productions against the before uh, we will leave here and touch briefly on, on fair contract terms and if there is time. If there is no time, yeah, I mean, it's already three according to my watch. But just before we go, uh, what happened in photo production against Sikoriko? Well, uh, uh, briefly, in uh, Photo production against uh, Sikoriko, there was a, a contract uh, by which the plaintiff was supposed to have the defendant uh, provide night uh, patrol security services for their, uh, their factory. I mean, just like you have like maybe like a company and they have like a, a private security company. There was a same scenario in the uh, photo production against uh, Sikoriko. With the contract here uh, between the plaintiff and the defendant was for provision of a night patrol service for their factory. And there was supposed to be four visits a night. And of course that was going to cost uh, money. Now, the main dangers or perils, or perils which the parties had in mind, fire and theft. So do, those were like the main things that the guard was supposed to secure the company uh, against. And uh, well, I noticed that uh, you have uh, another uh, class, but uh, because you have another class, 
I will just say that you have to go and read uh, photo production against ecological uh, transport. But what is really important as far as that case is concerned is that uh, the House of Lords said that the old approach uh, as far as fundamental breach is concerned in relation to exemption clause was, was wrong or was, was, was to be departed from. And, 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 and for that matter, uh, the court advanced what they call the constructionist approach that there's nothing like fundamental breach automatically disabling application of the exemption clause. No, in the court's view, uh, anytime there was a breach and whether exemption clause will apply or not apply, what was important was a question of interpretation. If you interpret the contract as a whole, what do you gather as the intention of the parties? Can we say that from intention of the parties, if this type of breach occurred, then they did not want the exemption clause and anything in the contract to be applicable. If that was so, then that would be it. On the other hand, if by interpretation, uh, there was nothing like that, that if there's a, a breach, it does not really affect the operation of exemption clause and all that, then it was not right for you to just invoke fundamental breach so as to uh, automatically truncate the operation or the effect of the exclusion clause. So uh, the takeaway is that photo production against ecological transport came to uh, confirm uh, some line of authorities that uh, exemption clause and all that is a matter of interpretation and fundamental breach had been applied wrongly. And that shouldn't be, yeah. So as I said, because you have a class, I will allow two or three minutes. If you have uh, any uh, question, just put up your hand and then I'll call you before I end the class. Let me see if I'll see some hands up. Uh, okay, so there's no uh, hand up. Okay, let me release. If you if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can just uh, you can just unmute yourself. Okay, so since there's no question, let me leave you to go for your next class. So have a very good afternoon. Mm-hmm.